Hey, I'm Llewellyn Falco, and this is my Agile thought of the day. I just actually got back from Open Agile uh, SoCal, which is just a fantastic open space. If you haven't been to one, highly suggest you go to one. But one of the things I started thinking about at the end of this was theory-based testing. This is something that's sort of come up from time to time. It's extremely useful when it does come up, but something most people haven't even heard of. So I just sort of wanted to share my experiences with it uh, with you. And to do that, let's first just start talking about testing in general. I think most people have a general idea of what unit testing is. And so this, this shouldn't seem that unexpected. Unit testing basically takes the form, uh, given A and B, then we need to expect C. All right, uh, so a good example of this is, is sort of um, this addition problem math. So um, given A and B, then A plus B should equal C. Or to be a little more concrete about it, given two and three, then two plus three should equal five. So this is nice and it's simple and it's the way most of my unit tests actually work because it's it's very deliberate given this code to a process. Right? Um, but it's different than theory-based tests. Theory-based tests basically say given A and B expect theory. And the nice thing about this is theory is consistent. Unlike the C where every time I have an A and a B I need the C, here I just have a so um, let's use the math again, but here let's use the theory that if you add something and then subtract it, it you end up at the same place, right? So, uh, so for subtraction, we'd say for A and B, then A plus B minus A should equal B. So nice and simple. Now I can throw things at it like two and three, but I no longer need to know about the outcome of this. So I can throw things at 45 and 98, or 2015 and thing, or give me a random number from that's less than 100 and a random number that has less than 1,000. Or if I wanna be really complete, give me the range of numbers from one to 1,000 and the range of numbers from one to a thousand. And so now I can sort of test all of these combinations are there. And so this is a really powerful aspect of theory testing is that once you have a theory test, you can kind of just throw data at it and check just a much bigger range of situations uh, than you can normally do in a unit test where you have to sort of figure out the results of all those situations. So I said before, you know, this is really powerful, but I don't get to use it a lot. Let me give you just a couple examples of places I might use it. Uh, one really common theory test that's interesting is that hash code should equal, or, or should be equal when an object is equal. So sort of just put this down, given object A and B, expect that if, a is equal to B, then A dot hash code should be equal to B dot hash code. And so the neat thing about this is all you need is an object generator to throw stuff at here, but you'd be surprised how often this fails, that developers implement the equals but never pay attention to the hash code end up with these objects that are violating this, this sort of core theory to an object. Um, so, so, so somewhat useful here, not, not greatly useful. Um, one of the places I see it a lot, and, and I wanna say so I get sort of two variations of this. And, and the, the hash code is the two things should be produce sort of the same result. So sort of given A and B then a of something is sort of equivalent to B of something, right? And so you see that kind of theory hit a lot, right? And actually that's the, the theory that I see the most use from in my personal experience. And so the, the equivalent of this theory is given A, some function, right? And A prime, some function 
that has been refactored of A, then, and usually of B, right? Then expect that A of B equals A prime of B. So the new code should produce the same results of the as the old code. This is the definition of refactoring and is a really nice way to test code because even if you're not entirely sure if you don't have a piece of code under test, you can always just clone the method and test that they actually still do that. In fact, I'd really like to see functional IDEs do this when you re when you change code inside of a method. Just automatically test the the what you did before you saved and what you did after and check if the behavior is actually changed. So this is this is the refactoring theory and, and this occurs quite a lot. The other sort of theory I did is, is actually the math theory that you have there, which is you, that you have A and or so A of B and A inverse of B. And when you have that, the theory is sort of A of A1 of B is B. And so the inverse, that, that's what we saw there with the negative and the plus. But also, um, I was using this with stuff like, I had a turtle, right? So if you think back to logo, it was very hard to test, hey, this function should move the turtle like this. And it was interesting that I could write inverse functions and say, hey, you know, even for a very complicated situation where if the turtle is more than 90, then do this. And if it's less than do that and turn, I could just write the inverse function as a test and say, hey, for a whole bunch of situations, start the turtle here, do A, then do A inverse and check that the turtle ended up at the exact same place that it started. And so once I did that, I, I, it allowed me to do a lot of testing. A lot of the the programming that I do where I write tests for kids to see if they're actually not as unit tests for development, but as actual exam verification is done using inverse test because I, I can actually assure that they've done the right thing and, and do it with a lot more cases to make sure that's right there. So anyhow, that's theory based testing. Again, it's not the kind of everyday use, but when you do find a use for it, it's an extremely powerful way of testing. Hope it serves you well.